Good morning, everyone. Greetings to you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm Leslie George, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this day's session uh, on learning from the Word of God. Thank you for everyone who joined from the different parts of India and from other parts of the world. Uh, today, we are looking at the topic of apologetics, and uh, I welcome Brother Johnny Burgess for today's session. He has been, over the last six months, he has been taking us through various aspects of apologetics and helping us understand how we can give a defense of our faith to the skeptics. The Bible is the word of God for us and it is inerrant. But what the skeptics try to do is to discredit it and disprove it by talking about it as a collection of fables or mythology. And one of the ways they try to do it is by saying that there are apparent errors and contradictions in the Bible, and the Bible contradicts itself. And today, Brother Johnny Burgess is trying to help, uh, will help us understand how to answer these kind of skeptics and how to answer these kind of uh, questions that might arise. So let us pray that the Spirit of the Lord help us understand these things. And before I hand over to Brother Johnny Vargas, shall we look into the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father God, Father Almighty, thank you, Lord, for giving us this wonderful day to come into thy presence. Thank you for the new day that you've given us. Thank you for the rest that you've given unto your hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us this opportunity to study from the Word of God in a systematic manner. Father, when people are confused for lack of knowledge, we thank that you have given us this opportunity to understand your Word, to study your Word. Father, help us to live out a life that is worthy of your calling. Father, even as this day, as we look at the apparent errors and contradictions. We pray that you strengthen Brother Johnny Vargas to <clears throat> explain these topics to us, Lord. We pray that you fill your son with the word and the necessary wisdom to explain these things to us. We pray for each and every one who has gathered here to study the word of God. We thank you for the desire that you've given in everyone's heart to study from the word of God. We pray that you open each and every person's hearts and minds to accept the things and not just take it in. And we also pray that we are able to live it out in the world also so that the world can see that we are being genuinely called to the <clears throat> We commit all the infrastructure. We commit all the people managing the infrastructure. We pray that you have complete control of that there be no disturbances or hindrances to study the word. We pray for the people who might be watching on YouTube and, and Facebook, Lord. We pray that you touch their hearts to understand that word. We come with the rest of the time into your hands, Lord. Take and feed that joy. Let everything that we do be for thy glory, Lord. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Johnny Rogers, over to you. Yeah, praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's a joy to be in God's presence this day. And we've been looking at various topics in the field of, <coughs> sorry, in the field of apologetics. And uh, today we are going to do something that comes in the category of exegesis, in the category of explaining the content of the Bible. And that is a uh, response to claims of contradictions and errors uh, that uh, people have made about the Bible. So I'll just share the screen. Yeah, are there errors and contradictions uh, in the Bible? Okay, uh, the approach that we're going to do uh, is that we will take examples from daily life or from other fields of knowledge or other fields of study or other sources 
and we will see how uh, it is possible to think that there is a mistake or there is a contradiction when actually there is none. So the stand that we will take, the stand that we will take in this session is that there are no contradictions in the Bible. There are no errors in the Bible. Uh, that is only what we expect if it is God's word. But uh, since the Bible may be unfamiliar to some of us, uh, since it is written in another time and place, uh, and since we are not directly seeing the events that uh, are being described in the Bible, uh, it is possible that some of the things that are written in the Bible may appear to contradict each other or they may appear to be wrong. So we will see some examples of how uh, this works out. And uh, towards the end, I will try to say something about how uh, practically we can deal with people who come to us making such uh, claims. Okay. Uh, one example of uh, so-called errors that people have pointed out in the Bible is just a case of the use of non-technical language. Now, we use non-technical language even today. For example, when we say the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west, now, strictly speaking, the sun does not move around the sky. It is the earth that is rotating. But as seen from the earth, the sun appears to rise in the eastern sky and then it goes up in the sky and then it sets in the west. So although we know that this is uh, this uh, effect that we are seeing is just an artifact of the Earth's rotation. That does not stop us from using such language. And we find that in the Bible also, this kind of casual, non-technical language is also used. For example, in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, um, you know, we read uh, about Joshua asking the Lord and the Lord grants his request. And the sun stood still in the sky. So Joshua wanted extra daylight, extra, extra time of daylight in order to complete the defeat of his enemies. So he prayed to God that the sun would stand still. Now, today, somebody might say, well, the sun is always still only. So there is no sense in saying the sun stood still. Um, it is the earth that is moving. Yes. So we know that uh, when God answered Joshua's prayer, you know, what God would have done is that he would have stopped or slowed down the rotation of the earth. That's what God would have to do. But as seen from the earth, how does it look? It looks as if the sun was traveling from east to west in the sky. And then for some time, the sun appeared to stand still in the sky. So uh, even today, we talk about the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. So it makes perfect sense for a person like Joshua or the writer of the book of Joshua to say that the sun stood still. Okay. Then we have a phrase like the four corners of the earth. This phrase comes in the Bible on several occasions. Uh, literally speaking, this phrase makes it look as if the earth is a sheet, a rectangular sheet with four corners. Um, well, the earth is not that way. The earth is a sphere. We know that a spherical surface does not have any boundary. But this expression, four corners of the earth, is used even in secular language. If you read novels, you will find that uh, this, this phrase is used sometimes. If you read news articles um, um, and, and general secular literature, you will find people using this phrase. It is just a symbolic way of saying, if the earth was a rectangular sheet, then imagine the ends of the earth. So when people say four corners of the earth, they just mean that you know, from wherever you are, just go ex go to the extreme north, extreme south, extreme west, go in all directions. And this news has reached up till there, or uh, this uh, this phenomenon that I'm taking place has uh, is taking place in the four corners of the earth. So when when someone says four corners of the earth, it is just a figurative way of saying throughout the earth. And the Bible also uses such figurative or non-technical language. Okay, so some of the so-called errors or contradictions in the Bible are just an example, uh, are just actually examples of non-technical or figurative language being used. Um, there is an account of Solomon building the temple. And in the temple, uh, there was one of the accessories there was a huge bowl, which is called a sea. Uh, it was a bowl made of metal and uh, water was put inside it. 
so it was used for people to wash and it was written that it was 10 cubits from end to end so the diameter was 10 cubits and the writer also says that a line of 30 cubits uh, goes around it a line of 30 cubits went around it okay so the diameter was 10 cubits the circumference was 30 cubits okay if you divide these two 30 divided by 10 is 3 okay but now it's a well-known mathematical fact that for any circle when you divide the circumference and the diameter you know you should not get 3 but you should get 3.14159 and so on okay so this is a special number the number pi it's the ratio of circumferences to diameter so according to the biblical uh, definition or the biblical uh, data here the value of pi is equal to 3 whereas in actual fact it is equal to 3.1415 so on so many people will will uh, complain that you know this is an error in the bible a wrong value of pi has been given and even in ancient times even in ancient times, uh, there were mathematicians who knew the value of pi at least uh, to a few decimal places of accuracy. Today, it's known to billions of places. Uh, so what about this? Well, uh, people who are very much focused on maths here and thinking about the exact value of pi uh, are forgetting something which is valid in science and engineering. And that is that any data any measurement is always an approximate value and it is always rounded off okay for example if you're using a simple measuring tape to measure the length of something it is not appropriate for you to say that the length of it is 3.467 meters um, you should round it off and say it is only three meters or it is only four meters okay so if you look at the circumference which is given 30 and you divide by this exact number pi uh, 30 divided by pi turns out to be 9.54 and um, anybody will tell you any science student will tell you that if you get 9.5493 as the answer you need to round it off to 10 okay you need to round it off to 10 because this is a simple measuring line which was used so uh, the problem is not in the bible these are standard operating procedures whenever we make any measurement in science architecture or engineering all measurements are accurate all measurements are rounded off to a certain number of uh, to a certain number of digits and there are rules about how you should round it off so uh, the data that is given here is in perfect agreement with standard practices of rounding off and reporting approximate values okay the purpose here was not to calculate the value of pi uh, the purpose here was just to describe the uh, temple construction uh, in a way that uh, everyone can understand. Okay, even with this simplification, many of us will find it difficult to understand the description of the temple. Now, here is a contradiction. This is this is a slide that I use in my own physics teaching. So we have a basic formula, and that basic formula yields uh, some result here okay concerning energy and then we have another method so you have this basic formula for the same thing and it gives the final result okay now students usually notice that there seems to be a contradiction here okay there is a factor of half here which is not here so there seems to be a contradiction between these two formulas okay and yet you find that the final answer is the same in both cases here the same final answer is obtained so if these formulas don't agree with each other and if one of them was wrong then how is it that both of them give the correct answer well the answer to this question is that in these formulas there is no contradiction because although the symbols used are the same the quantity being referred to is slightly different they're similar quantities, but not exactly the same thing. So I will make students write down very carefully, what does this B stand for? And what does this B stand for? They are similar quantities. It is easy to get confused between them, 
We use the same symbol for both of them, but they are slightly different quantities. So that it looks as if there is a, a, a contradiction, but there is no real contradiction. So I'm calling this semantics. Semantics means the meanings of words or the meanings of symbols or the meanings of things. So here the V and the V are the same symbol, but they mean two slightly different things. So sometimes there appears to be a contradiction, but it is not a factual or not a general contradiction. It's just a case of semantics. For example, uh, here is a verse from the Bible which says, the hair is unclean for you, although it chews the cud because its hoof is not divided. And um, any um, anybody today will point out to you that Hairs do not chew the cut. Okay. Hairs do not chew the cut. Then why is it the Bible is saying that the hair chews the cut? Now we must understand that the Bible was not written in English. The Bible was written in Hebrew, that too, not modern Hebrew. It was written in very ancient Hebrew. This is from the Pentateuch. This is, you know, the oldest uh, Hebrew that there is. And in, in Hebrew, uh, there was just one word which was used for chewing the cud, and it literally means to take up again that which was put down. To take up again that which was put down. So uh, that's what animals do when they chew the cud. They have eaten something and it has gone down to their stomach and then they take it up again. So it means to take up again what was put down. Yeah, so what, what do hares do? Uh, they eat their own stool. They eat their own faces. Okay. Uh, they, they eat their own feces. That means they have put down something and they are taking it up again. So while the English term chew the cut is very specific, the Hebrew word that is used there is general enough to include both activities. Okay. Whether the animal is chewing the cut literally or whether it is eating its own feces, uh, the both activities can be described by saying that it is taking up something that has already been put down. Okay, so in Hebrew, there is no contradiction. It just looks awkward when it is translated this way in English. Perhaps the translators could have, uh, you know, uh, used a literal translation, although it takes up what is put down again. Um, that would be accurate, but perhaps a little more awkward when it is read in English. Now, uh, in the Bible, terms like whales and fishes are used synonymously. Okay, so anyone today will point out that whales are not fishes. Well, the English word today, fish, refers to a very specific category of aquatic animal. Uh, and whales are mammals, so they are not included in the fishes. But in Hebrew, the word that was used there was just used for a creature that swims in the sea. So it's just an issue of semantics when one language is translated into another. In the list of unclean birds, bats are also mentioned. In Leviticus, you have unclean birds written there. Bats are also given there. Well, a bat is not a bird. But again here, the English word bird refers to a specific class of flying creatures. And bats again are mammals. Uh, other the common birds that we know like crows and pigeons are not mammals so bats are mammals they've come in a separate category so in english we would not call them birds but in hebrew we have one word which is used for anything that flies and so there is no contradiction it is just that uh, words in different languages have a, a different range of meanings uh, what can the translator do now? He cannot invent new words in Hebrew or in English. He just has to uh, take the closest English word and put it there in place of the Hebrew word. Okay, so there is no contradiction or no error that is there here. In Genesis uh, 22, it says that after these things, God tempted Abraham. And in James, we are told that God never tempts anyone. Okay, so... If you look up the websites of skeptics and atheists, this is also one contradiction uh, which has been listed down. 
Now, whenever you read a verse in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, uh, it is worth looking up the original meanings because uh, the Old Testament and New Testament were written in two different languages. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. Now, uh, this Hebrew word, which has been translated as tempted in uh, English, is also used for testing. And so some translations today will say, after these things, God tested Abraham. God tested him by asking him to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. And Abraham passed uh, that test because he was willing. So it was a test. Uh, the word temptation in Hebrew uh, includes this meaning of a test. Whereas in James, when James is telling his audience that God does not tempt anyone, if you read the context there, uh, he talks about every man being tempted because of his own sin, his own lust, and he says that uh, lust gives birth to sin and then sin leads to death and all that. So there, uh, the, the, the subject is not testing. The subject is getting seduced with evil. There are wrong things that appear appealing to us. And when we are attracted to that, then that is also called temptation. And here James says that God never tempts anyone. God will never put sinful pleasures in front of you to attract you. Uh, Satan may do that, but God does not do that. But God indeed tests people. He tested Abraham and he might test you and me also. So uh, there is no contradiction between these two statements. It is just that the word tempted means different things in different contexts. So sometimes uh, a, semant a semantic issue is mistaken for a contradiction. Now, suppose uh, we ask, you know, how much does a Honda City cost? And you looked online and or you asked somebody and one person said that it costs 14 lakh and 92,000 rupees. And then you ask somebody else and then he says 12 lakh, 12,031 rupees. That is the cost of the Honda City. So there is a contradiction between these two values, okay? So do you really think that uh, some of these uh, websites are lying here? Uh, what would a website gain by lying about the price of a Honda City? No, all these are true. So how is it that uh, you know two different sources are giving different values and how can both be true? There are various reasons for which uh, the total can differ, even if both are true. Now, one of the reason is that there could be variation in time. This is probably in one year and this is probably in the next year or a few months later. It could also be that there are various components and uh, the, the sources are not including the same component. Like here, fast tag has been included and here it has not been included. So. Uh, when you report a total, there are so many subcategories and sometimes it's just a matter of choice which categories do we include in our total and so the answer can be different. So sometimes it looks as if there is a contradiction, but the variation is due to time or due to including different categories within the total. Okay. Matthew says that when the Lord Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves with him. And the two thieves also reviled him. That is, along with the rest of the crowd, the two thieves insulted him. Luke tells us, one of the thieves reviled him, but the other rebuked this fellow, saying, don't you fear God? We are suffering justly, but this man has not done anything wrong. So there is a contradiction here that... One author is reporting that both thieves insulted the Lord Jesus, whereas the other author is uh, reporting that it's only one thief who insulted him and the second thief was a good person. He was admonishing the first thief for insulting the Lord. Well, how do both fit together? It's just like the Honda City example. Just as the price of a car can change with time, the attitude of a person can also change with time. Uh, crucifixion does not last only for two minutes for somebody to make this kind of statement. 
crucifixion lasts for hours together. It is a several hour affair. So during the course of several hours, it is quite likely that a person's attitude can change. So evidently, now looking at both these uh, witness uh, eyewitness reports, we can say like this, that initially both thieves must have reviled the Lord Jesus Christ. But then something must have happened. Uh, the second thief must have noticed something. And then he realized that uh, the person who was being crucified next to him is not an ordinary person. Uh, he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. Because he said, when you come in your kingdom, then remember me. So he somehow realized that. Uh, and that's why his attitude changed. And then he started admonishing the other thief who was uh, continuing to insult the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, as, as, uh, as somebody said, um, the one thief was saved, you know, so that uh, nobody might despair. You know, even at the cross, even while being crucified, there was hope. Uh, but then both thieves were not saved. So none should presume. So uh, different people react differently to the same circumstances. One person had a change in heart. So there is no contradiction between Matthew and Luke. Matthew is telling us what happened at the early stages of the crucifixion. And Luke is telling us what happened a short while later. There are two lists of David's mighty men. In 2 Samuel chapter 23. And after the captivity, there was another account written. That is First Chronicles 11. So if you look up the names, they don't match. So there are some names that are common and there are some names that are different. So, you know, those who are uh, eager to show some mistake in the Bible, they will say that there is a contradiction. Well, if you ask me to give a list of my students and after some time I give a list, again, you will find a contradiction between them. Why? Because new students join sometimes. Sometimes there are students who quit the program midway. So if I give you a list of students at two different times, okay, the list will have contradictions. So this is not a real contradiction. It's just that um, uh, the list can change with time. Uh, perhaps there were some people in David's uh, group of mighty men. Uh, they might have got killed in battle. And so they were replaced. It is also possible that some people retired. Uh, perhaps some people were dismissed because they did something wrong. Perhaps some people, uh, you, you know, got into some quarrel with David and they were no longer comfortable being part of that group. Many, many reasons are there uh, for two lists to differ. Similarly, when the people of uh, Israel were returning from their captivity, uh, they, they counted the number of people who were coming back. So Ezra says that there were 200 singers who were coming back. And Nehemiah says that there were 245. The interesting thing is that Nehemiah is actually looking at the records that people like Ezra made. Because Nehemiah came later and he is looking back and checking the records as to who all had come back to Jerusalem before him. So how is it that Ezra said 200 and Nehemiah is saying 245? Well, the answer is very simple. It could be that there were certain people who came a little later. So Ezra came with many people with him and there must have been 200 singers along with him. And then maybe a few days or a few weeks or a few months later, there were some more people who came and they were just added into the same list. So a few days after Ezra and his group reached Jerusalem, perhaps there were some other people. They had wanted to join Ezra but maybe they got delayed and so uh, they couldn't make it on time. But then they made it a few weeks later and they were also included in that list. So there is variation in time. Uh, that is not a genuine contradiction. Everything changes with time and every report, every record has to do with some instant in time. So these things can change. Now, there are, there are some contradictions uh, that appear to be there but when you look closely the contradictions will vanish okay now this i admit this example is perhaps not very good 
because it is uh, complicated and bizarre. It may be difficult for some of us to understand. So the, the, the contradiction is like this. Uh, suppose there is a long ladder and we run towards a short garage. Uh, so uh, you see the two options given here. So does the ladder become shorter and then fit inside the garage? Or does the garage become shorter and so the ladder is not able to fit inside the garage? Now, uh, if, if this question is asked to you, you might feel like saying that, uh, you know, well, what's the big deal? Just measure the length of the ladder, just measure the length of the ga garage. If uh, the ladder is longer, it won't fit. And if the, garage, uh, if, a, if the ladder is shorter, then it will surely fit. What is the paradox? What is the dilemma here? Okay. Well, uh, according to uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, when the objects move, uh, their length changes, okay? Now, this is an effect that we don't observe because the objects that we are looking at are moving too slowly. Uh, this is a theory about extremely fast moving objects. So suppose a ladder was moving very fast, you know, so fast that it would take only one second for it to reach the moon, that kind of velocity. Then Einstein's theory says that there would be, con there would be contraction. Okay, so which would contract? Would the garage contract? Because when I run towards the garage carrying this ladder, as seen by me, the garage is moving. And uh, if somebody is uh, standing near the garage and walking uh, and watching, then as seen by him, the ladder is moving. So which one is going to get contracted? There is a dilemma or there is a paradox. Okay, books have been written about these paradoxes, as you can see. Here is another one called twin paradox. So these are two twins, okay? And behind them, there is a spaceship. So one of these twins is an astronaut. So uh, this astronaut goes inside the spacecraft and then he comes back and you can see these two pictures. In this picture, the astronaut's hair is gray and his, tin, uh, his twin's hair is black. So, which means the astronaut is now older than his twin brother. And in this picture, the astronaut's hair is black and his twin brother's hair is white. So that means the person who stayed on the earth has become older and the astronaut is still young. Okay, now if this is told to you, which of these is true? You will say both are false. I mean, if they are twins, then they will always be twins. If their age is the same, then their age will always remain the same, uh, even after he goes and comes back on his journey. But again, according to this theory, which is very strange, but true, when, when somebody goes on a journey or when, when we are looking at somebody in a journey, uh, it look, uh, they will appear to age slower. Okay, So when the, when the ordinary person looks at the astronaut going away, then uh, as seen by him, the astronaut should become younger. But then from the point of view of the astronaut, uh, it looks as if the earth is going away. And so his brother should become younger. So that is the paradox. Okay. So uh, it looks as if Einstein's theory is giving a contradiction. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it says this person should be younger, but it can also be argued that the other person should be younger. Okay. But uh, these are standard examples in the study of this theory. Uh, if you look into the details of the theory, if you carefully examine, then you will find that there is no contradiction. It is possible to say clearly which of these two scenarios will take place. Okay, in this case, uh, the first one turns out, uh, sorry, the second one turns out to be correct. The astronaut will remain younger and his twin brother on Earth will age. So there is a clear answer. So it looks as if there is a contradiction or a paradox, but actually there is none when you examine the details. The same thing applies in the Bible. When there seems to be a contradiction, look into the details which are given, and perhaps then you will get an, an answer to that. In Exodus 9, Moses tells Pharaoh that if you let, refuse to let us free, God's hand will be on your cattle, and uh, so that's what happens. So all the cattle of the Egyptians died because God sent a plague on the cattle. Then after some days, the Egyptians still didn't let the people go. 
So God sent more plagues. So finally, there was a plague of the firstborn. At midnight, God struck all the firstborn of Egypt dead, right from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of those in prison, and not only the people, but even the firstborn of the cattle. So many people have pointed out that if all the cattle of the Egyptians died earlier, then how come here we have firstborn of the cattle? This is just a few days after this. The plagues were happening in quick succession. You know, uh, a plague would, would be inflicted, then Pharaoh would re refuse to repent and let the people go. And so a new plague would come. So this was happening in the course of a few days. So on Tuesday, if all the cattle of the Egyptians died, then how is it that on Friday there are still cattle and uh, only the first spawn of those cattle dies? Look at the details of the situation. There is another sentence actually in verse 6. No cattle of the Israelites died. When the plague of killing the cattle was inflicted, it was inflicted only on the Egyptians. So all the cattle of the people of Israel was intact when this earlier plague was inflicted. So now it is easy to imagine what must have happened when the uh, Egyptian cattle died, but the Israelite cattle did not die, then the Egyptians must have either uh, bought or confiscated or stole uh, the cattle of the Israelites. So, uh, you know, if, if my cow has died and I need my cow for various purposes, and if I find that there is, there is somebody else who still has so many cows with him, why don't I go and buy it? Okay, so that is obviously what must have happened. And so a few days later, the Egyptians again had cattle and the firstborn of the cattle died. Okay, if you lose your phone, you're not going to stay without a phone for the rest of your life. So things do change. So the contradiction vanishes when the detail is checked. Uh, when the people of Israel were just about to approach, uh, just about to enter the promised land. So there was a false prophet called Bala who wanted to curse them, but God turned his curse into a blessing. Uh, but then what Balaam was able to do is he was able to get the people of Israel to sin against God. Uh, they sinned against God and they committed uh, adultery with the Moabite women who were staying in the vicinity. And so God uh, sent a plague on the people of Israel. So many people died on this plague that God sent as a punishment when they committed sexual immorality with the Moabite women. So Numbers 25, 9 says 24,000 people died in the plague. Then many years later, the apostle Paul is reporting on the incident. He's saying you should learn lessons from these incidents of the past. And then he says... 23,000 people died. So there seems to be a contradiction. 24,000 versus 23,000. But now in order to resolve a contradiction like this, you need to look into the detail. So when you carefully examine these verses, Paul says 23,000 people died in one day. Whereas in numbers, it just says that 24,000 people died. Okay, so evidently what must have happened is that a total of 24,000 people died but the deaths might have been spread out over two or three days. So in one day, 23,000 people died and the remaining 1,000 people must have died the next day or in the next couple of days. So there is no contradiction when you look properly into the details. Many people have said that in Genesis uh, 1, a man and woman are created simultaneously after the animals. But in Genesis 2, man is created before the woman and before the animals. Uh, when, you, when you look carefully at the accounts, you, you see that in Genesis 1, it never says that man and women are created simultaneously. It just says that both were made on the sixth day. In the sixth day, God said, let us make man in our own image, and he made them male and female. So nowhere does it say that God made man and woman simultaneously. It just said says that he made them on the sixth day. So it could have happened that he made Adam in the early morning 
and he must have made Eve uh, in the afternoon or something like that. That is very much possible. Genesis 1 is only giving the days. On the other hand, we also see that Genesis 1 is a systematical, systematic chronological account. In Genesis 1, we have days being clearly numbered, 1, 2, 3, right up till 6. And we are told specifically what things were created on each day. So here you can understand that Genesis 1 is a chronological account. So from this uh, Genesis 1, we realize that the, uh, that, that the animals uh, were created first and then God said, let us make man in our image so that he can have dominion over all these animals. Okay, so the sequence is clear there. Whereas in Genesis 2, uh, it is a summary of what has what has been already taken place. So uh, it says that uh, uh, God formed man of the dust. And then uh, it says out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Now it is true that the creation of man is mentioned in verse 7 and the creation of the animals is mentioned in verse 19. Okay, but this does not mean that man was, the author is trying to say that man was created before the animals. The author is mentioning the creation of the animals because he wants to report a certain incident. All the animals were brought to Adam and Adam was uh, made to give names to these animals. So in order to uh, introduce us to this incident of animals being named, uh, the writer is first giving us the background that, you know, God had created all the animals. And then after that, he brought them to the man. So this is not an attempt to give a chronological sequence. It is Genesis chapter 2 is trying to tell us certain important or key aspects. Animals were named not by God, but by man. The author wants us wants to communicate that to us. The purpose of Genesis 2 is not to tell us the sequence of events. The purposes of, of Genesis 2 is to give us the details of the events whose sequence is already mentioned in, in Genesis chapter 1. So uh, who gave names to the animals? Uh, what did man say when he met his wife? Uh, how did he feel about her? Um, you know, how did he come to know that uh, or how did he uh, feel the need to have a companion? Uh, the, the author wants uh, to explain these things. How did marriage start? Uh, this is the purpose of the author in Genesis 2, not sequence. So when you look at the detail, when you examine the text in detail, there is no contradiction. The purpose of Genesis 1 is to supply chronological sequence. The purpose of Genesis 2 is to uh, give us some key thematic elements in uh, what transpired. When did Mary anoint the Lord Jesus? Uh, there is an incident in the Gospels. It is confusing because there is one unnamed woman, a sinful woman who anointed the Lord Jesus. She is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, but I'm not referring to her. I'm referring to Mary, uh, the sister of Lazarus. Okay, She anointed the Lord Jesus Christ shortly before his death. So in John's gospel, it says that uh, in chapter 12, it says that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany to Lazarus' house and they made dinner. And while the Lord Jesus was having this dinner, or during that occasion, Mary took uh, the costly perfume and anointed the feet of the Lord Jesus. So this evidently happened six days before the Passover. This is from Mark. Uh, Mark tells us in chapter 14, after two days was the feast of the Passover. Okay. And the chief priests and the scribes uh, were discussing about how they might take him by craft and put him to death. So they wanted to somehow apprehend the Lord Jesus Christ and execute him. But then they said, not on the feast day, verse 2, not on the feast day, let there be, lest there be an uproar on um, uh, by the people. So they don't want to have this uproar because on the feast day, Jerusalem is extremely crowded. So they said, let us kill the Lord Jesus, but not on the day of the Passover. Okay. And then Mark says, okay, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came and she did all this. She anointed the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the disciples complained that uh, so much of money is being wasted. Those same complaints are recorded in that incident in John chapter 12 also. 
Okay. So reading the gospel of Mark, it seems as if this event took place two days before the feast of Passover. Whereas in John, we are clearly told that it took place six days before the Passover. Okay. So how do you resolve this contradiction? Okay. We have to look into the details and we have to see what the author is trying to convey. In Mark's gospel, chapter 14, he begins by saying that the Pharisees or the chief priests and the scribes were thinking about how to put the Lord Jesus to death. The two problems are there. First of all, they have to catch hold of him. He is always surrounded by his supporters. So that is an issue. How do we, how do we catch him? Okay. Secondly is um, the now the feast is coming. The place is very crowded. So we need to kill him at a time when Jerusalem is not crowded. So they want, they are thinking about how to solve these two problems. And later on, we read that Jesus was crucified just on the Passover day. So how is it that when the, when his enemies said that we don't want to kill him at this time, uh, they ended up killing him just on that day. How did that happen? Mark is trying to give us the background and explain to us how did this happen, that the chief priests wanted to kill him, but not on the Passover. And then they ended up doing exactly that. How did it happen? Because the chief priests, they got a windfall or they got something which they never expected. Something happened for them to help them. They got an unexpected help. And what was that unexpected help? That unexpected help was Judas Iscariot. In verse 10, Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went out unto the chief priests to betray uh, him unto them. Now, how did uh, Judas um, you know, think or what made him uh, decide to betray the Lord Jesus? Okay, uh, There must have been many things, but there was one thing which finally tilted the balance and made him make up his mind saying that, okay, I will go and betray the Lord Jesus. And that was this incident. Okay. In John's gospel, we are told that among the people who criticized Mary, Judas was the most prominent. He was the one who was criticizing her the most. And uh, he was the one who had the bag of money. And actually he used to steal money from that. Those kind of things are mentioned in the gospel of John. So when this woman spent so much of money in the Lord, on the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus commended her, and when the Lord Jesus said that she is doing all these things because I'm going to be buried now, I'm going to die now. When Jesus said all these things and reprimanded him for criticizing this woman, uh, there was some crossing over, a tipping point for Judas Iscariot. And then he went to betray the Lord Jesus. So perhaps he had some difficulty uh, in uh, locating the chief priests or getting an appointment with them. This happened six days before the Passover. But he was able to actually meet the chief priests and scribes only two days before the Passover. So there is no contradiction. This event happened six days before the Passover. But Mark is telling it to us in his narrative when he reaches two days before the Passover. He is flashing back because his purpose is to explain the actions of Judas and the actions of the priests. How did they end up killing Jesus on the very day they said they will not kill him? Uh, because of Judas Iscariot. And Judas Iscariot managed to meet the chief priests two days before the Passover. So they thought that, okay, if this fellow is available, then that's the best deal for us. And so Jesus ended up getting crucified on the day, very day of the Passover. So you look into the details and the contradiction vanishes. Now I'm returning to this example. Um, here I want to point out the apparent absurdity. This example probably looks foolish to most people. I mean, how can the age of two twins be different? If these two people are of the same age, like if both are 20 years old, then how can it happen that one person is 40 years old and the other is only 30 years old? Okay, this sounds nonsensical. Okay. Well, it turns out that this is true. But as I said, this, is, uh, this effect is prominent only if the spacecraft travels very fast or the person running with the ladder runs very fast. Nobody can run that fast. So uh, in real spacecraft, 
that we have today with our technology okay who knows what we will have 100 years later but with today's technology and with the speeds with which spacecrafts travel today the astronauts uh, become maybe a fraction of a second younger than their twin brothers just a fraction of a second it's nobody will notice it. okay if you travel a lot by flight uh you will become younger by a fraction of a second okay but this is true it has been found experimentally to be true our gps works using these principles so what is the lesson that i want to learn from here something may seem absurd when uh we are unfamiliar with the circumstances under which it is written okay so einstein's theory is about very fast moving objects and all around us we see objects but they don't move so fast so you don't notice these things okay all credit to einstein for noticing this but we don't notice these things because the objects around us don't move so fast this is a theory about very fast moving objects so very fast moving objects do certain things which are quite different or which are in a much greater degree than what slow moving objects do so we don't notice it So as I said, when you travel by flight, often if you're a frequent flyer, you're younger by a fraction of of a second compared to what you would be if you were not a frequent flyer. But this is too small to notice. So here we see that certain things can be absurd when we look at them in a different context. So uh, we know the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain killed his brother Abel, and then he went away from where his family was living. and the bible says cain knew his wife cain knew his wife and she conceived and then he built a city okay and who was cain he was the son of the first man and the first woman so um, when we think of city we think of uh, new york and or mumbai millions of people are living in this city uh, well that that time there was only one family right so where is the question of building a city and who was his wife by the way whom did he have to marry so these things look absurd to us because we are living in circumstances and in situations which are very very different from what cain is living in. you need to understand that the bible was not written yesterday these are things that happened thousands of years ago the world that we are living in today has been this way just for the last few decades or for the last few centuries depending on which features you're looking at okay uh, these people lived in a world which was very different okay so let's let's take these two things i think uh, we'll only have time to explain these two things and then we'll be done first cain had a wife and he had uh, sexual relations with her and they had a child okay from where did he get his wife the only people that were living at that time would have been cain's siblings and cain's parents eve is a mother of all living okay so whom did cain have to marry now for us it is unthinkable uh, for us to marry our own sister okay it is unthinkable for us to marry our own sister and uh, it's not just that uh, that feels repulsive uh, intuitively Uh, but there is a scientific reason for that also uh, that uh, if uh, if a person were to marry his own sister and if they were able to produce offspring then uh, it is quite likely that the child would have congenital defects perhaps you know people who have married their cousins and their children have certain problems uh so this this happens uh, uh you know when you marry within among close relatives and it's going to happen much more likely and much more severely if you marry your own sister okay but now we need to realize that uh there has been a genetic degradation every time human beings reproduce they are making copies uh, there is a copy made of their genes of their dna and imagine taking the xerox copy a photocopy of a paper again and again and again you will find that the subsequent copies are not so clear as compared to the first few copies or as compared to the printout so here adam and eve are the original they are the printout and cain was like the first order xerox copy and you and i are photocopies of the 100th or the 1000th order so it's um 
So we have a lot of genetic defects in us. And if we marry our sister, the, or, or if a woman marries her own brother, then they both have the same genetic defects. And so the offspring will surely be uh, deformed. But if you marry somebody who is not your close relative, then your defects are not the same as her defects. The generations are different. The defects are different. So where she has a defect, your genes are good. Where your genes are bad, her genes are good. And so uh, the offspring is more or less normal. Now, this problem did not exist for Cain. Cain had very good genes and so did his sister. So they could marry each other and uh, produce healthy offspring. And if you're thinking this is weird, well, Egyptian pharaohs also used to do this. Okay, um, you can tell that to your secular friends that you, you, you definitely know about ancient Egypt. This is what Egyptian pharaohs used to do. The, in order to preserve the royal bloodline, they used to marry their own sisters or their own relatives. Okay, so what seems weird to us is not weird in its original context. Then it says Cain built a city. How can you have a city when you only have one family living in the earth? Well, first of all, we need to realize that the word city in ancient Hebrew does not mean a metropolis like Mumbai. Okay, it only means a fortified location. So imagine there are people staying in a place with some fortification. Okay. And then it is taken for granted that their occupation need not only be agriculture, but since there is fortification and there are people staying there, there could also be trading or business going on. So Cain did not found a metropolis. He founded a settlement with some fortification and he also invented business activities. He and his descendants, they also invented business activities there. Okay. Now, how can you have a city with only one family? <clears throat> now we must realize that Adam and, Lee and Eve lived for more than 900 years. Just because only two or three sons are mentioned, it doesn't mean that they had only two or three sons. They must have had dozens of children, all of them, all of whom who are going to live for 900 or 800 years. And in that long lifespan, they, each one of them is going to have many children. So Cain was intelligent. Cain knew that in the years to come, the population is going to multiply. Uh, people would not be kind to him because they know that he has killed his brother. So it is worth having a fortified place for himself. Okay, So that's why Cain built this so-called city. It was a fortified place. By the time Cain died, uh, the population of the earth would have been several hundred or perhaps more than a thousand also because of the long lifespans and the many children that everybody would have. Okay, so what seems absurd from our perspective is not absurd in the original context. This has to be kept in mind. Our time is up, so we'll stop here and may God help us to uh, explain these things to others. After we deal with the others, I will just talk a little bit more about how we can uh, uh, answer people who come to us with claims of contradictions. But may God help us to be effective uh, witnesses about the truth of the Bible. Thank you very much.